So we just finished talking about the drinking water that we have and how that water comes to be, how do we clean it, and some of the issues surrounding clean water. Now what we're going to investigate is kind of the other end of it. We talked about taking water out, but what about putting water back in? So this section is going to cover the Clean Water Act, which is a law that was designed to answer that very question. What do we do when we put water back into that ecosystem? So thinking about our previous section, thinking about our drinking water, you know, after you drink it, where does it go? Not just drinking it, but remember our drinking water is everywhere in our household. It's in our dishwasher, our washing machine, our showers, our toilets, our sinks. And if you look at all the water that you and I use, all the drinking water, we use on average in America about 90 gallons a day. So it's not just, oh, here's the water I drink. It's looking at all the water that you're using. If we actually look at all that water we're using, a majority of it is actually used for flushing the toilet, which is kind of sad because of all the water we use, that's the one that doesn't really need to be that clean to begin with. It doesn't matter if you pee in dirty water or clean water, it's still pee and it's still being flushed down the toilet. So although this graphic shows you tons of different numbers, the main one that I want to point out is the toilet. Like the toilet is definitely the one that we are using the most of our drinking water. And then if you look at other things, our shower, the faucet, so taking water directly from the sink, clothes washer, etc. But know that toilet is the highest, which is kind of pretty impressive. So we're actually going to investigate the toilet. Well, kind of. I mean, we're going to investigate all of these. But when you flush that toilet, where does it go? You know, when you run the dishwasher, where does that water go? And fortunately, it doesn't go directly into the environment, at least not here, uh, because that can be very dangerous uh, and can cause a lot of disease, especially when you're looking at toilet water. But in the United States, we have a fairly advanced uh, sewer system, uh, as well as a different system that maybe you have in your home, a septic system. So if you look at all the homes in the United States, about a quarter of them have what are called septic systems. Septic systems are self-contained, meaning they're not hooked up to the city, they don't go anywhere. Like this is something in your backyard that you use and that's it. So let's talk a little bit about how they work because some of you might have these or at least maybe you've heard of these before. So here's your house and here's the pipe coming out of the house. Now that pipe is taking all the water that you have used, all of the wastewater, and taking it somewhere. So toilet, shower, dishwasher, etc. So it flows out of your house and this cutaway is showing you that this is underground. Uh, typically in your backyard, could be in your front yard. And it goes into something called a septic tank. Now a septic tank is really just, it's a tank. And inside that tank is usually a lot of different bacteria that were purposely placed in there. You can actually buy packets to flush in your toilet to rejuvenate the bacteria in your septic tank. And what happens in this septic tank is that all sorts of solids, whatever those solids may be, will fall to the bottom because they're heavier. And the bacteria breaks those down. It'll break the solids down back uh, into liquids or into really small pieces. And then what will happen is all the liquids and all the light stuff on top of the septic tank, remember heavy stuff's going to sink, but the lighter stuff will be at the surface. That lighter stuff will then leave the septic tank and go into something called a drain field. This drain field is essentially a whole bunch of pipes uh, or maybe more hoses that have lots of little holes in it. And then that liquid will slowly seep out of them over this large area. And that liquid uh, will move down. So gravity is kind of pushing it down through the soil, through like bedrock and things like that. And although it's not clean per se, the environment, nature, is the one actually breaking it down. Nature can break down all sorts of things. So what we're doing with the septic tank is we're kind of collecting those solids. We are breaking down those solids. But the liquids and stuff, we're kind of putting directly in nature. But it's at a slow rate that nature is able to break it down and make that uh, substance safe again. 
So this is about a quarter of the United States. You typically see this in rural areas uh, or even older areas. So areas that maybe it's hard to get a sewer system in or an area that's been established for so long that it would just be way too ex uh, expensive to put in a sewer system. But let's talk about sewer systems because more than likely uh, you guys are probably on uh, the sewer system line. <clears throat> so if you do not have a septic tank, then what's going to happen is that it's kind of similar to the beginning of the septic tank system. There's going to be a pipe that leaves your home. And that pipe is collecting all of the wastewater that your home generated. But instead of that water going into a tank that's in your household or in the land around your household, it's going to go to a wastewater treatment plant. And I'll talk more about them on the next page. But talking about locally here in Germantown, so here's the Germantown campus. And really not that far down the street uh, is the Seneca Wastewater Treatment Plant. This wastewater treatment plant in uh, the Germantown area, this is run by WSSC. You may have heard of them before, may have seen them on your water bill, may have seen, uh, if you look at manholes, you might actually see WSSC. That's the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. Might be Sanitation Commission. It's on the next slide. Uh, but this company is the one who's kind of running all of the water systems in not just in Germantown, but really in the whole Washington wide area. Now, if we look at our wastewater treatment plant in this area, the wastewater treatment plant is going to clean that wastewater before that water re-enters the environment and is re-entering the environment into uh, Great Seneca Creek. So a pretty local water body uh, is where our wastewater is going. So it's kind of imperative that it's clean uh, before we put it right back in the environment, an environment that maybe you fish in, that maybe you walk along. If we didn't clean it, it would literally just, it'd be so disgusting that you wouldn't want to enjoy that water body. So this is what a wastewater treatment plant kind of looks like. Obviously, depending on how big it is, it's going to look a little bit different. But all of these tanks you see are actually tanks of wastewater. And in each of these, there's different processes going on in order to uh, eliminate you know, biosolids, to eliminate nutrients, to eliminate uh, all sorts of things, and to clean it before entering the water body. You don't need to know uh, these specifically. This is just giving you an idea that these are limits of what that water needs to look like when it leaves the wastewater treatment plant. So they're looking at things like suspended solids. So how much stuff is in it? And when I say solids, I don't mean poop. Like by the time poop gets to a wastewater treatment plant, it's already broken down into like uh, dirt, more or less. Uh, what suspended solids means is just stuff, such as dirt, such as dust, such as sand, such as just anything that's floating in the water. It looks at you know, nitrogen and phosphorus, so different nutrients. Uh, it looks at how much oxygen's in that water. Remember, oxygen in the water is so important for our fish species. Uh, it looks at chlorine, because they're using chlorine to clean it. They look at pH. They look at fecal coliform. Fecal coliform is a common bacteria in our feces. So it's not just, oh, here's all the wastewater, and we'll just quickly clean it and put it in the environment. They actually have a lot of regulations to make sure that the water that is leaving the wastewater treatment plant is uh, acceptable for that surrounding environment. So we're going to take a quick pause. Now, you guys already watched a video that looked at how we clean our drinking water. This video is looking kind of how we clean our wastewater, and actually a lot of it is the same processes. So I'm really going to test you on the drinking water ones, but I want you to make those connections between a drinking water filtration plant and a wastewater treatment plant and see that a lot of the same processes are used because the goal is the same, to clean up the water. Obviously the standards are a little bit different, but still kind of the same processes. So go ahead and pause here, click the link that is popping up, and take a look at that, and then come on back. But why clean the water, right? Like it's going into the environment, like why should we care? Well, we rely on the environment, right? We rely on those freshwater resources. We rely on saltwater resources. If we didn't clean that water coming from our wastewater treatment plants, you know, it, it affects more than just us. It really affects the entire ecosystem. 
these four pictures are just showing you examples of really human impacts on water uh, and kind of the worst case scenario. So here we have tons of plastic pollution. Here's an oil spill. Here's just pipes that are draining who knows what. Uh, here's, we saw this before with eutrophication, here's an algae bloom. So we as humans make a huge impact on our water resources, yet we are the one using those water resources. The statistic is just so staggering. Uh, so this is by the EPA, and they said in the United States, about 40% of our waters are not safe enough to swim in or fish in. Not safe enough to drink, it'd be a lot higher if it was safe enough to drink, but safe enough to swim in. That those waters are so bad and so toxic that if you swim in them, the likelihood of you getting sick is pretty high. That you can't fish in them, one, because fish aren't in it, or two, fish are in it, but they have so many toxins in their body that you don't eat it because you could definitely get sick from it. And that's sad, 40%, so nearly half of all the fresh water that exists is too toxic for us. And a lot of that has been years and years of abuse. It has been years and years of pollution. I'm not even years, just decades, honestly, centuries of pollution. And we're just now starting to make those changes. So when we look at our wastewater treatment plants, our wastewater treatment plants are one of those changes. Those are one of the ways that we are addressing this issue of water pollution. The reason those wastewater treatment plants have standards is because of a law that came out in the 70s, the Clean Water Act. You may have heard of the Clean Water Act before. So this came out in the early 70s to really address this issue, this issue of our water is so toxic to us. And we realize that's unacceptable and that we can't keep living like that. So the Clean Water Act is managed uh, and governed by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and this should kind of ring a bell when we talked about agriculture. Because when we talked about agriculture, remember the EPA was concerned about fertilizers and pesticides getting in the water. This is why, because of the Clean Water Act. Now the Clean Water Act doesn't protect all freshwater in the United States. It protects a good portion of it, uh, but there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about why those exceptions are in place. So first one's related to farming. A lot of farms have irrigation canals. So essentially they're ditches, uh, and that's kind of what this next one is. They're ditches that exist maybe in between their rows, around the outside of their fields. Something that was artificially made, and yes, there may be water sitting in it, but that water is not connected to anything. It's not connected to a creek or whatever. It's a self-contained water body on that farm. And because it's self-contained, really there shouldn't be anything living in it in the first place. No one's using it for drinking water or for swimming. The whole purpose of it is just for crops. Uh, so EPA doesn't really regulate that kind of water. Same with agriculture ditches and roadside ditches. Depending on your neighborhood, you actually might have some roadside ditches. Uh, sometimes they lead to nowhere. They're just ditches so that the water's not backing up into your house or backing up into the road. It's meant to hold the water until the water dries up. It doesn't drain anywhere. So because, again, they're not going anywhere, the EPA is like, you know what? If we were to regulate every single water body in the United States, that'd be insane. So they have these exceptions because it's like, well, it's not leading to anything. No one, even and organisms, aren't using that water. Uh, so yes, if there's pollution, it's not that big a deal. There's some more exceptions, though. Another one is artificial lakes and ponds. So for example, in Maryland, actually every single lake that you see is a fake lake. Uh, it was artificially made. It may have been made by a dam. It may have been made for your neighborhood so that it looked pretty. But they're not connected to a water body. Uh, if there's any kind of fish or organisms in there, it was accidentally put in there. Uh, or maybe a person purposely put them in there. But it's not a naturally occurring fish that exists there. And then finally, you know, sometimes streams that exist and did connect to bigger bodies of water get cut off. Maybe there was a landslide. Maybe there was an earthquake. Maybe human development. Something happened that cut off that stream from the other part of uh, the ecosystem. So 
when we look at that, we see that, okay, well, this stream isn't connected to anything, and maybe there's still some organisms in there, but not that much, and so we're not too concerned about it. And so again, these exceptions are in place because the EPA does not have enough manpower. The states do not have enough manpower to go out and monitor the pollution in every single piece of fresh water that exists. So these exemptions aren't out of laziness or aren't because of lobbying. It's just really because of ease. Okay, what do we really need to protect? Because what are people using? What are organisms using? Now, when I say they're protecting pollution, but what I really mean is they're regulating point source pollution. Uh, so there's different types of pollution that we'll explore in this lecture and the next one. Uh, but specifically, we're looking at point source. And let me give you a couple pictures of what point source pollution looks like. <laughs> 